Hello everyone, welcome to This Week in Tyranny, it's the most hardcore news show on earth and I'm going to skip the introductions and go straight into the material. It's Friday, September 6, 2024, this is episode 92. Uh, before I even begin, I'm realizing this episode, I'm going to, I spent a lot of time putting it together here on vacation in Florida, the Sunshine State. Uh, I had to cover things up because it was too much light, so, you know, you don't get to see the ocean behind me. I put a lot of work on in on this and it's going to be I have to read it there and the way this is set up I really uh, have no other way to do it I don't want things to get lost in in translation so it's gonna be a lot of me reading it but it's important so th maybe this is the kind that you just throw on and, and listen on to in the background because you'll be watching me look like this for a, a good percentage of it I'm um, saying that off the bat now the topic of what we're talking about last week I talked about children being killed I talked about the genocide in Gaza and now it's hard for me to actually get over it to pick a topic right to do it this week different topic and then pretend like that's the most important thing now you know uh, because that's still going on it hasn't changed but I have no choice that's exactly what I'm gonna do right episode after episode I talk about different things what's going on so that is exactly what I'll try to do except this really is a part two to what I talked about last week because there's a different kind of genocide of children taking place here in the United States and I'm referring to the way kids grow up hating their bodies that's the way I'm going to describe it there's a growing number of people rejecting their gender young people right significant portion of kids and it has become normalized and accepted how could it not become normalized and accepted when teenagers and young adults keep identifying as the other gender or not identify as a gender at all and this is the case in an urban area like chicago where i'm from it may not be as prominent everywhere uh, but it does exist and is spreading and it's going to spread so when I say the phenomenon of kids rejecting gender, really what I'll focus on, I'm talking about girls here, predominantly girls, right? While boys, of course, are a part of this, this is right not limited to the half of the population. It's nowhere near 50-50. It's, it's much more slanted towards girls that are rejecting being a girl and wanting to become a a boy so we're not talking about boys rejecting their masculinity we're talking about girls rejecting their femininity and I'm gonna go into that in detail why are they doing that what's going on so with that little introduction out there this episode is detransition is part two it's literally a follow-up to episode 79 of this week in tyranny and I did that show June 9th uh, so 6 9 and then this one I do on 9 6 and it's fitting because this is the whole idea of polarity, right? The number six and the number nine being reflections of each other. The same way that the genders, the men and women are reflections of each other and they're complementary, right? So the loop on the number six or the number nine, it represents reception, right? The, the circle. And then the line on the number six or the nine, it represents transmission, right? You got your transmitter and you got your receptor. Um, and I, I will go back to that a bit I didn't go into that in, in detail it's not really a symbolism heavy show but it's all part of this conversation you it's like with these with the gender thing you can't talk about one without the other uh, it's all interconnected last thing I touch on before I really get started it has to be explained and emphasized why it is of utmost importance this topic I'm not just acting like it's important it's it has to be talked about and that is because as the cliche goes right children are our future all of us are going to get old and in this high-paced world we're we're getting old rather quickly so before you know it i'm going to be 40 others will be 55 60 70 into the 80s right and soon all of us we will no longer have a large influence or impact on the world the generation that our children today the teenagers they're going to be in the driver's seat we're going to be in the pa in the pass back seat not even the passenger seat and the world is going to continue and you won't be able to do anything about it soon but you can now what kind of a world are they going to be growing up in the children 
and how well prepared will they be, how capable they will be of living in such a world. That's why it's important. That's why it requires a long-term view, which human beings have never excelled at throughout history on a large scale, but especially today in 2024. This is the time of immediate results, instant gratification here today. And that means that human beings are actually regressing. This is a backward step in development. The, the way we develop, we go from moving from total dependence on our parents, partially becoming more independent, going towards total self-reliance. And that's done how? By developing foresight, long-term thinking. That's what makes you an independent being, is how well you can plan for the future, right? If you're only gathering food for today, you're, every day is going to look the same. You have to go forage for food, you have to do all this. It's long-term planning that makes us different as human beings, what makes us developed and independent. So a long-term view is the only way to obtain freedom. The immediacy of the moment enslaves us to nature's violent swings, it enslaves us to our own instincts. It enslaves us to, it makes us weak to the long-term plans of others. If someone has a longer-term plan than you, they have power over you. That's how it goes. So for this reason, the most important thing that can be done today is, is paying attention to children and the effect that we have on their development. And that goes for any people in any nation at any point in human history, but especially this, uh, this affects the children of the United States of America. Uh, why? Well, mainly because the safeguards against tyranny in the, in the United States, they're not going to go away in a single generation. It doesn't matter who wins this election. It's not a historic election. It's not going away in a generation because in the South and outside of the cities, anywhere really except the metropolitan areas, People understand the value of life. They just get it. They know that satisfaction and fulfillment comes from actual everyday activity with people, with family, with loved ones. So no matter what you put on TV, what fear narratives you, uh, you, you put on social media, they're living too close to the natural world is the point. They live too close to that for them to give up their sense of reality the way people in cities have done people in cities have done that that's one thing two gun ownership is just too high for any significant reorganization of society they're just not going to do it as soon as you get serious power outages food shortages threats to the survival of an entire household these are the kind of conditions that are you know created by totalitarian regimes in order to uh, rearrange an entire society that won't work because the sheer number of gun owners would result in significant pressure to institute a way of life that resembles the old traditional way of life so which which is what you take care of your family you take care of your own household and you don't trespass on the life and the home of another so neighbors are going to stick together or at the very least they're going to leave each other alone that's the american way and that alone makes a totalitarian takeover impossible for as long as that hands off do whatever you want american style is alive there's going to be a level of freedom and for those two reasons the earliest that a takeover and destruction of american society can occur is when today's children become adults i don't want to lose people talking about this takeover and all that i'm talking about gender it's really going to be heavy on that but I have to justify my general claims that this is an actual genocide, right? This, this, is, this is such a big problem, and I'm just giving the actual reasoning for doing that, for the people who are the masterminds of that. That's why they're doing it. So that is why this week's show is about those children who have transitioned. Transitioning meaning rejecting their gender, receiving hormones or other substances that interrupt or modify the natural sexual maturation process and three undergoing surgery to cut off or otherwise modify the breasts or genitals essentially that's transitioning detransitioning then is when a person turns away from the drugs and hormones not necessarily reverting back to their original gender sometimes they do sometimes they don't 
but detransitioning is the process of turning away from medical procedures and dealing the issue dealing with the issue of gender identity themselves okay so my last episode about this number 79 was named detransitioners the most courageous people in the world and i made that connection between them and the predicament that the average person finds themselves in the way that we need to face the reality that basically every aspect of the world is built on lies almost all popular viewpoints are totally wrong and that real value and real beauty in the world is suppressed and therefore the path to true fulfillment for us to truly be happy in our own skin is to turn back from the artificial world we grew up in and return to the natural world returning to the real that's another key idea that's going to be in this episode what is real versus what is fake the deeper and the unspoken meanings of, of gender and why it's meaningful and three why the feminine gender is so hated and rejected by young girls and of course much more you know and from my background and context that i'm using for this i'll be reading from some posts from reddit reddit is the biggest online community platform in the world it's the largest website of free exchange of information that's not social media right you could say that facebook or x is is the biggest website but but reddit is anonymous and that's it's significant i mentioned in the first episode that the dtrans subreddit r slash dtrans short for detransition it had 30,000 members it now has 55,000 members obviously that's a mixed bag we're not saying that everybody of those 55,000 is a detransitioner that's not the point and of course you should question and scrutinize the source but very rarely do people actually throw in the question like credentials of others they rarely look in an online community of people and question whether the people there are legitimate members that they are who they identify as but they do when it comes to people who disturb their beliefs and their narratives and that's why the stories of people on the dtrans subreddit are commonly ignored and downplayed i'm going to use them anyway and part of this is just the reality of the internet you you don't ever really know who is writing what and whether it's true but nevertheless there's a process of verifying these accounts verifying as in you can come to a solid idea based on the information and intuition put together like whether something is true or not you can look at their post history what have they said their common history reddit allows you to do that it shows the user's past activity it's a good idea to read over a person's thoughts and then see for yourself if there's a cohesion and a unity there uh, this is how you can tell trolls apart you can just read what they have written and if it makes sense you can tell if, if this is a real person it's not that difficult um, yeah but the internet is a shady place so anyway let me begin this is a um, this was written on September 1st so recently uh, someone writes in the dtrans subreddit curious about you guys experiences finding therapists slash counselors that will help with the gender dysphoria and general detransition pains I feel like every therapist I've been to will short circuit every time I mention that transitioning was harmful for me and they'll just start repeating pro-trans slogans or tell me all about their trans clients that actually really love transitioning. I don't know, is it even worthwhile to look for a therapist that is understanding of my situation and won't get super uncomfortable talking about how transitioning can be harmful? Because I'm starting to get the feeling there aren't any left out there. And this demonstrates the problem and why I'm spending my vacation thinking about this and my Friday recording it. Are the people who are in positions to help children actually helping them? In other words, if I don't do it, who will is the point. Because the people who have been trained to assist young people who are questioning their gender as a concept, while being on testosterone and other hormones, weighing the, the consequences of removing certain body parts, and then the people trained to help them are repeating pro-trans slogans. That's a problem. But, but think about one of these therapists or counselors. How good could their training actually be? Like what sort of textbooks can they read to deeply learn the intricacies and the nuances of gender? What overall cohesive idea do they have of a relationship 
and how to explain that to a sexually developing child or young adult. They couldn't possibly know the weight of that predicament and those decisions. A few of them do, and they're the ones who are attacked by their colleagues all the time. And for stories like that, I strongly encourage you to visit a YouTube channel called Gender A Wider Lens and their website, genspect.org. I'm going to link that. They've interviewed whistleblowers who have exposed such professionals who are blindly and irresponsibly pushing medical gender procedures with religious enthusiasm and downright fervor, religious fervor. It would be quite accurate to say that the hiring practices and the selection of these individuals who who specialize in gender issue advice, counseling, and therapy, it would be accurate to say it's essentially based on how dedicated you are to the dominant narrative and your sense of enthusiasm regarding how beneficial or possible it is to discard your gender and actually change your gender. In other words, it's not about what you know or how much you know, it's how much you believe and this is the criteria for choosing uh, gender care professionals. Uh, and that's been exposed. Like, this is why I refer you to them. Because that's, that's really beside the point of this. But it is one of the points. Is the people who are in these institutions in, who are supposed to be impartially, objectively helping uh, these people, they're actually ideologically slanted. And that's, this is why I don't trust job, job titles when it comes to matters regarding children. Psychologists have given parenting advice in the past that was abhorrent, and time has shown that, like not responding to a small child crying. They used to say that. Um, I Look, I respect knowledge and experience, but I'm never going to trust whose job it is to guide and protect children any more than my own estimation of who is actually willing and able to do it these therapists are a problem the people hiring them are a problem the people putting forward these ideas are a problem but the solution is in us taking on the role of these counselors and therapists yes the parents need to teach their children these concepts they need to model healthy relationships with themselves as well as with others and it's their job right it's the parents job but what if they don't do it and even if they do it, the parents, even if they do a perfect job, their influence is still up against the enormous influence of the internet and the peer group of the child. So, so the answer is, us regular people, you and me, we need to become knowledgeable and start communicating these things to children. That, that, you're not, um, that you can love your body, you're not a slave to society's gender-based standards. And that these medical treatments are not actually medical, they're not actually treatments, they're state-sponsored damage and theft of your future potential. I'll expand on that. Now this is one reply to the post about the experience finding therapists and counselors. So they're out there, I found one, three exclamation marks. But you have to look beyond the LGBTQ bubble. Trauma therapists are a good start. They might not be advertising themselves as supportive of detransitioners or gender critical because it could jeopardize licenses in almost every state. When you book your 15 to 30 minute free phone consultation with someone new, that's the time to state that your need is for detransition and trauma treatment and to explicitly state that you are not seeking help with trans identity affirmation and that if they have any kind of a conflict of interest, then they should inform you before moving forward jeopardize their licenses so we've all seen that before right a certain type or subset of medicine becomes embedded in the profession and then when it turns out to be harmful the health professionals have to hide that they're actually against it uh, all the vaccines especially the seasonal flu shots that's an obvious example if you're against it that, that's trouble doesn't matter if it proves to be a b and c but a better example of this would actually be ailments of the mind. Anything having to do uh, with the mind and the emotions is explained away as a chemical imbalance, right? We've all heard this before. And then there's a drug for each and every one of them. All, kind, all kinds of depression, bulimia, bipolar, all the different disorders. There's always a drug for them. And it's always about a chemical imbalance. It's never about a way of life, right? It's... it's 
it's nothing that you can actually change through behavior, change through working on your thoughts and emotions. And this is the same idea with gender identity. Healthcare claims to understand it, they can't understand it. It's an unimaginably deep area of life that we have simplified and made sense of through traditional gender roles. But when old systems get thrown into question, right, and they no longer give a satisfactory answer, the answer is not to cling on to old systems like religious fundamentalists. The answer is to explore it more deeply. Because if there is a merit and a value to being a woman, and there is, and that being and that that is fundamentally tied to a person's identity and it is if that is true then the case for it can be made in an infinite number of ways in all different areas of life and that's what i'm going to attempt to do in this episode but i'll be honest it'll be only partially successful at best because no one understands this fully that's the truth the connection and the relationship between children parenting uh, sexuality and gender what to tell them what not to tell them when to have certain conversations what should they be exposed to at what age does it happen to what degree is each child different and to what degree are they the same so when and how should the formula for parenting be adjusted is there even a, a formula right but regardless of those views and answers ultimately all of us need to dedicate more time listening to understanding and talking about identity self-worth self-image the value of the human being the freedom to make choices and the consequences of those choices with adults too of course but the vast majority of time should be spent on children and meanwhile these children who need counseling and therapy from what is essentially medical malpractice they have to tiptoe around the ideological views of the so-called healthcare professionals. You know, what they said conflict of interest. What doctor or therapist has a conflict of interest? That means an agenda. It means these people have an agenda. Okay. Next reply. It's impossible, they say. I legit can't find a therapist that doesn't go to pride events and that sort of stuff. Like, sure, I'm gay, but it doesn't mean that I want a therapist who believes a kid should be mutilated. I absolutely hate my therapist for letting me on blockers. Blockers meaning puberty blockers, meaning that around the age of 10 to 13, they, took, they were given these drugs that stopped the production of testosterone or estrogen. That's what we're talking about with blockers. And they say mutilated. Mutilated is a strong word and it's incredibly sad. It's charged with emotion. And it has a connotation of tragedy and senselessness. And I've used this word before to talk about these surgeries. I know that other people use this word too, especially those who, who care about people and see the abhorrent nature of these surgeries. Now, there are plenty of people who care about people but do not see the nature of these surgeries. Uh, they, that's why they would, they would cringe at this word mutilated. And at the other end of the spectrum, you get a term like gender-affirming procedure to describe the same thing, a totally sterile and unemotional term, right? And while I'm not disagreeing that a mastectomy or a phalloplasty is mutilation, it is, but I wanna be somewhere in the middle with when I say this, so I'm just gonna call it sexual surgery because all of them have to These aren't sexual organs per se, but the only reason you would want to even change them is because of the psychological association between those body parts and biological sex, right? So they're all sexual surgeries. And the reason I bring it up is to make the point that sexual surgery is something that no child, teenager, or young adult can possibly fully understand because grown adults don't understand this. And we spend, as adults, our 20s, like, a majority of, of, of our life of our young adult life exploring our sexuality and our role in life and our identity really we for the rest of our lives we're exploring it and that so that goes for later in life as well and there is no magical age at which a person can make permanent changes to their body we call we say 18 is when a person becomes an adult it's totally arbitrary 
there are a bunch of these young adults in their early 20s and they're way too young to to be having these sexual surgeries but also by what right can anybody stop them by what right can you stop a 16 year old from doing it if they demonstrate self-reliance and cognitive ability and they've stated their free will claim to do it how can we tie them down and hold them down we don't actually have these answers to say it definitively what we can say definitively objectively is that surgery is something that a person has to go undergo voluntarily meaning you have to say yes to it you have to consent to it unless it's a matter of life and death I've undergone surgery without my knowledge of approval but that's because it was life and death I was bleeding internally from a car crash and would have died within an hour or so so I'm very happy that those people made the choice to just do the surgery without my consent but if it's not a matter of life and death it's not a grave health risk what right does anyone have to do surgery against a person's will and the reason I mention this is that yes transgender surgery as a whole has a huge question mark on it to what degree does the patient understand the procedure and so then to what degree can they really agree to it or not this should be kept in mind when we think about what children are told about these surgeries right by the health professionals but we all need to look at ourselves again because society already takes a part in these sexual surgeries long before the trans thing was a thing for for centuries for ages and no one says anything about it circumcision is done within the first few days of a person's life the most sensitive area of a person in the most sensitive time of their lives is cut off literally like with a knife it's right it's an ancient religious practice healthcare institutions they claim reasons for it now right their reasons are dubious at best and they for damn sure don't warrant a traumatic surgery done on an infant which results in the genitals being left permanently in a state that biologically is only designed to be temp be left in temporarily right i'm talking about circumcision here this is body modification like the indigenous tribes who have their religion their cultural custom is to have children undergo the, these radical body alterations it's not a medical procedure it's medical malpractice to perform such a procedure and and if the word mutilation ever applied to a surgery this is the one circumcision and it's over half of kids in america in, i think it might be more that number seems low to me uh, it's going it goes on all around the world all the time and nobody says anything about it and i don't get how you can justify this it's a baby what 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 is the justification for this and what's crazier what's crazier than this because this is done to women as well except that for women there is no medical justification that can be made to do this to a child see with men they say that cutting the foreskin off reduces the risk of infection well there is no way that cutting off the clitoris or the inner labia can reduce a risk of infection but rest assured that these insane tyrannical culture these cultures they find a way to do it anyway and they do over 230 million women and girls worldwide 144 million in africa 80 million in asia 6 million in the middle east and 1 to 2 million in other parts of the world as of 2024 and what is this called officially it's called female genital mutilation uh, no one calls it male genital mutilation but that's what it is look this is genocide what what the entire world does to boys and girls is it's killing humanity how can you even estimate what effects this has later on nobody knows how can you scientifically show the relationship between natural sexual sensation the relationship between that and pregnancy later health marriage the development of the child science and medicine doesn't even think to look at it and i'm going to go back to the topic of trans kids now but this is occurring every single day simultaneously and it needs to be talked about alongside gender identity i am absolutely done with these insane cult customs affecting gender identity 
and sexuality. I'm done with letting authority have a monopoly on parenting and relationships. There is no authority. You are the only authority on this. If you don't teach children that they're wonderful as they are, who's going to do it? Um, third comment reply to um, the person talking about counselors and therapists. They say, I do not trust therapists or anyone involved in gender or transgender health. All they're doing is bullying us in, under the guise of being healers or helping us discover our true self, aka get sterilized. I'm not religious, but was raised to be as a child. But anyways, I joined the church when I moved a, a few years ago to meet people. And because I think the overall messages about being pro-social are good. My church is big enough to have several counselors. I haven't gone to talk to them, but I would actually trust a Christian counselor over a professional therapist. Why? Because people involved in churches tend to want people to do healthy behaviors. Churches are built around families, unless they're the kind only old folks go to. Even though I don't believe in God the way Christians teach, and there actually is a such thing as God, but it's a normal function of the way our brains are wired, I would be open to talking to one of the church counselors. Basically, I trust someone who in the past I might have worried was transphobic because I understand now that many of the people I was told or suspected were transphobic were some of the only ones who actually saw how horrible transition was for us and were willing to say something. The problem with so-called transphobes is that there are often the people who are plain honest and especially when you're young. But even as older adults, we tend to trust people who sound nice more than the people who actually want the best for us. I read all that because two crucial points are made here. One is that the people that are tasked with helping, guiding young people, they're not actually helping them, they're not actually guiding them. According to this person, the church is more effective at it. And of course, I could get into how Christianity has damaged gender roles and sexuality itself. A whole different topic but credit where credit is due i could totally see how how the christian church can provide this sort of protection and framework which uh, within which a child can develop their identity undisturbed by harmful influences and it reiterates the previous point i made which is we just can't trust whose job it is with who, whose job it is to protect children it's our job it's our work to be done that's the first point second point is with how we sound he brings up we tend to trust people who sound nice more than the people who actually want the best for us and this is true when someone is making a decision that's going to hurt them the person telling them not to do it is going to sound bad that's just how it goes they're going to sound like the enemy and when a person is at the stage of considering hormones or surgery that might be unavoidable that this is how it's going to sound. It's going to get contentious. They're going to sound restrictive. They're going to sound rigid, right? But my point is, we have to work on how we sound when talking to children in general. This is about communication skills, which includes listening and responding to the other person in a meaningful way. Not a one-way monologue like this, but a dynamic exchange. Social media and healthcare institutions, they give them this. They, they are very in tune with how to make a child or a teenager feel significant. They're good at public relations. And then the parents and family who have done all this work to actually ensure that the children are in a good position, they get the carpet pulled out from under them by these outside influences. And you're left with your children talking to you like you don't understand them, right? Like you're out of touch with the world of today. Like you're insensitive to their ideas and their interests. And that's all because we have not worked on developing and organizing our lifelong ideas and values concerning fundamental life topics. And then we have not adapted that language by maintaining a dynamic dialogue with the youth to, to maintain that language, that connection with them. And this can be done. We just have to spend more time speaking in a way that breeds comfort. It doesn't elicit a defensive response, right? And then at the same time, while being gentle, be firm on what you know to be true. And most of all, it's just what about what you know. It's about the knowledge you have as parents, as adults. Demonstrate your own knowledge of gender, of identity, of life. And then the harmful influences 
will not be as effective because really there is no lot knowledge on the side of gender transition. It's a rebellion against tra tradition, first of all. It's, it's just a rebellion, right? It's very new. So the answer then to a rebellion is to reveal the values behind those traditions. If those traditions make sense, discover the values behind them and talk about those values. When that is done, then the rebellion can shift and the rebellion can be launched against the true oppressor, which is the suppression of human value and human sexuality. Now, these these people on this subreddit, they are, they've used the words mutilation and sterilize. It's very strong language, accurate nonetheless, right? But people will criticize D-trans as a legitimate source of detransitioner stories. Right, they question its validity and i want to read from a post of a different subreddit talking about this so you can get an idea of what they think like so you can get through to people who are in this transition gender affirming healthcare bubble right so let me read this i've been this is from three months ago i've been dealing with a lot of doubt and imposter syndrome lately so out of curiosity i visited rd trans I know that subreddit is pretty infamous compared to, say, actual D-trans, but I digress. Um, real quick, actual D-trans is another subreddit. You could tell by the name that it's trying to uh, portray itself as the true one, the actual D-trans. Uh, so just has some background, right? I'm going to continue back to what they said, but I digress. Tell me why the first post I saw was, Trans people look completely different to me after detransitioning, talking about how they just seem to look like their sex to me now. Huh? Three question marks. What are we talking about? Do they actually just let people talk about trans people like that over there? Holy. I exited immediately because I could tell there was a lot of bitterness and hatred towards trans people, not only by how many upvotes it had, but also because so many people agreed. I don't know why I did that triggered myself so hard you could tell this is a young person right this is a child right this is why i'm talking about this and this person's shock and surprise is from the language they use being completely different so they read the post of someone who was under an illusion and got free from it so they no longer use that language and that phrasing that the trans community uses so this gets interpreted as a lack of respect for a person's identity. Same thing when you don't want to call them by their pronouns. It's seen as, well, you don't respect a person's identity. Well, I respect, I do respect a person's identity, and I will call them whatever they want me to call them. But also, when you use this niche language, when you speak this language, it's a subtle reinforcement of the ideas and the viewpoints that are part of the LGBTQ bubble, right? As as one, as the previous person put it. In other words, it's supporting an illusion, right? And then this person says there was a lot of bitterness and hatred towards trans people. The bitterness and hatred is directed at the illusion. That's a normal reaction to being betrayed and being lied to. Okay. So what is this illusion? What is real versus what is fake? So the illusion that all these trans people get pushed on them is that if you have discomfort distress fear trauma or any issues regarding the gender identity that comes with your physical body then changing your body your chemicals your hormones your organs that that will resolve those issues that's the illusion that and that is a lie it will not resolve those issues the reality is those issues need to be resolved through an individual process of questioning exploring learning and accepting your physical body by working on your ideas and emotions the mind and the heart heal the body so i'm all for working on the body so that we can love ourselves more sure but the links between hormones and sex organs these are unchangeable they're predetermined and some people are dealt a really sad and unfortunate deck of cards because their hormones and their organs are truly incompatible with who they are and what they feel like. But the only cure for that 
is the long journey of finding the self and that journey does start with the physical body but it goes in the completely other direction of the physical body it goes to the deepest most unseen hidden parts of a person and no one tells these kids that they are misled to think that hormones and surgery are the solution and they're not so then under this post this is a moderator of this subreddit of this pro trans subreddit right so this is a mod this is somebody who's one of the administrators now they have these emojis next to their name transsex man 31 i guess would be their age so transsex man meaning this is a you know born woman who rejected their femininity right uh the, and then there are these emojis emoji of a syringe three and a half years and then there's a knife uh emoji one year so so that means that's how long ago they've received hormones and how long ago they've received surgery okay this is what they say it is highly recommended to avoid that sub like the plague it's full of transphobic larpers who just want to make trans people look bad honestly i wouldn't go looking for d, d trans content unless you yourself are considering detransitioning or you generally want to understand more and even then be very selective with the information you receive take everything with a grain of salt or the entire shaker scrolling through toxins like that is just digital self-harm remember that you whoever is reading this don't deserve self-harm in any way if you are struggling with digital self-harm there are resources for you and a community full of loving people willing to help you out and subreddit ftm venting for the vents that you need to get out here's an ex excellent article on the facts of detransition and then they link a page about detransitioning facts so this is what manipulation looks like uh, to tell somebody they wouldn't go looking for that content right keeping them away from from information this is a classic called technique be very selective with the information you receive well of course but nobody's saying that about the uh, pro trans stuff right so they're going to tell you this is what they tell us when when we're researching vaccines and, and and health foods and and so forth right we've seen this before scrolling through toxic places like that is just digital self-harm um this is really it's 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 really disgusting because you're keeping people away from from something now yeah being exposed to certain information is going to be harmful but i'm going to talk about that it, using these words though toxic places self-harm it is like those are code words to trigger fear reactions in young people and that's what disgusts me about that and then when they say there are resources for you there's a community full of loving people they're saying their community and their resources are the state-sponsored resources the mainstream so-called healthcare professional stances that's manipulation now here's a reply by the original poster right so now you're gonna see what the a person replies to this yeah no reading the shit in that sub made me go back to my old mindset of binary gender that concept i've been trying to dismantle in my mind for literal years so annoying i'm gonna touch on that the old concept of binary gender then another reply uh, again they have the syringe emoji 8 4 2017 knife emoji 7 8 2019 it's how long ago they received hormones and surgery they say scrolling down that sub is so dangerous like my partner generally has regrets about going on testosterone but we're working on handling that in healthy ways and feeling more comfortable in their body that place just looks like another incel black hole my fiance showed me that subreddit last week i feel devastated as now i think she wants my old male version back please don't ever show that subreddit to your partner as it'll cause nothing but harm to their psyche wanting their old male version back well she does want it back and and that's the sad thing about this is these teenagers are developing and you'll never be able to turn back from from this it's not reversible despite what they say and about binary gender yeah binary gender is restrictive but this is just reality so many of us wish we were born different that something about us was different 
and some things cannot be changed. What can be changed is our relationship to that ice cold truth. And that goes the same for every part of life, right? And they use the word dangerous. Yeah, truth can be dangerous. I've had truth hit me so hard that it could have killed me. Like that it really sent me on a in a direction. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the fact that it's true. So all we can do is work to speak truth in a way that is more meaningful and less traumatic. But a certain level of trauma is going to come with the truth. That doesn't mean we should avoid it. Now for a bit of a rebuttal here. Um, the, the title of the post is from two years ago. Actual D-Trans subreddit silences the voices of the transitioners? Question mark. They say, I really don't get the point of the actual D-Trans subreddit. Almost all of the moderators are still trans identified with the exception of one moderator. Any comments discouraging people from transitioning are downvoted. It just seems like a place where trans identified people go get their affirmation that they're making the right choice by getting surgery or transitioning as though you can't get that in literally every single other trans related subreddit it's incredibly frustrating that any kind of comment that is not entirely affirmative towards transitioning is downvoted it gives a false impression of what the d trans community is because it seems like it's entirely made up of trans people who are just talking over d trans people it's hard to think that they are acting in good faith because it really does feel as though they are trying to silence this community in favor of their own pro-transition narrative. It really says it all, but there's a reply here that I want to read as well. Honestly, I'm just so glad there's a safe place here to talk about detransitioning. Everyone in this sub has been amazing in all my interactions and it's really nice to have to not have our whole support community overrun with anti detransitioner propaganda and militant alphabet supers. I mean, even now in the middle of my detransition, I support trans people and their right to transition wholeheartedly. I just wish transition wasn't advertised like this exciting, easy, one size fits all, end of your troubles miracle. I wish that I had realized earlier that I was depressed, traumatized, and a victim of internal misogyny and not trans. A whole lot sooner while i am a still a staunch lgbt ally as well as someone who fully understands the trans issues it really hurts when trans community pretends i don't exist and that i wasn't hurt by their break all the eggs model and treats me like i invalidate their existence and am the enemy oh well i'll keep on loving and hope that someday i will learn to think harder before making these kind of choices about my body and health thanks for being here the trans subreddit so i can hardly believe that people still try to say these are fake accounts these are incredible people who have made such efforts to gain this level of insight and clarity and healing and i love the term internal misogyny i don't love it that it exists but it's a great term and i'm going to try to tackle that topic now okay I've mentioned that the issue that is fueling this number of young people rejecting their gender is really their unwillingness to live as a woman. So why? What is the thing about being a woman? What is it about a woman's role or a woman's body that makes kids fear and rejected? Well, the first thing is that a woman's body is inherently more dependent, is the more dependent one of the two genders, meaning less freedom. Women are physically less powerful. Then the cycle of menstruation, it re restricts her freedom of movement. She, she doesn't get to carefree do all of these things. And then in the sexual aspect, women are receptive. They're inward as opposed to outward. That in itself carries connotation of dependence. Even though that one is not so cut and dry because I would say, and most men would say, that men are much more dependent on sex than women are. But still that holds true. So, no wonder that maturing girls feel this way, because while their physical characteristics are taking them in a certain direction, their thoughts and their emotions are resisting being boxed in. That's totally normal, right? Um, while the physical and sexual parts of us are clearly different between men and women, 
their diff that difference is not so clear in emotions in the emotional realm or very similar now in general women are more emotional especially having more empathy compassion putting more focus on the importance of social interactions than men the feelings of others so there's a difference there but that's not a hard cut rule the way that muscle mass and reproductive organs are that's like a hard distinction and there's no changing it it's not that way in emotions there's a big overlap between men and women and how emotional they are and then when you go past emotions into the mental world the mind is even more genderless so as far as ideas and cognitive patterns and ability the gender differences disappear almost entirely and yeah we can think about different topics in different ways you know men and women but the nature of the mind is totally free of gender there's no dependence there at all as a mental being you are completely independent and this internal misogyny it's just a very unfortunate imbalance it's too much importance being placed on the physical and sexual characteristics because they are not the only influences on identity the body won't fundamentally change it doesn't have to your thoughts and your emotions can use this unfortunate reality to compensate for it right and to develop beyond these traditional gender roles while still being a woman because you will still be a woman so i'm not talking about feminism or the generational suppression of women that's another issue in itself the patriarchy and what that means today the issue is no longer suppression of women the issue is self-suppression by women and it's really destruction of what a woman is that's the issue today so when we talk about liberation of women and freedom what about the freedom one feels when they accept their body accepting the unchangeable rather than despair over the unchangeable that's liberation to me but it's hard to even explain this or to see it without having had the experience with sexuality and these young girls they're faced with these conversations while their body is still not ready for them to even explore this area and this is where hormones come into play the, the natural development of hormones plays an enormous role in our understanding of gender and our relationship with it so imagine the woman removed from sexuality the way a young girl is like a young girl is asexual she's not thinking about that and and then in her life gender identity is already this huge topic it's everywhere it's a totally foreign topic without the sex hormones being involved it, it's it's so alien and these girls viewing womanhood now how do they see it how would they see it would they look up to raising children and and staying home with them right maybe but how would they understand that motherly intuitive that instinct when they don't have the physical capacity to feel it yet they're much more likely to value more of the gender neutral attributes of the man right his predicament going the, the adventurous nature of going out every day having new experiences meeting people and coming back home that resonates much more with somebody who hasn't had the hormones released in them that that you know that a woman gets later on in her life in other words basically what i'm saying is we have no way to even know what our ideas about gender will be until we've had certain experiences and in modern life on top of that hormones have been disrupted to such a high degree the bpa the chemicals in meat and dairy uh, the preservatives and sweeteners then the unexplored potential links that decrease estrogen and testosterone there are so many of them food water medicine wireless radiation uh, geoengineering pollution epigenetics we have no idea how this affects us and because of that we have to lean on nature we have to lean on the blueprints that have proven to reproduce joy time and time again and what that is is a long relationship between a man and a woman essentially right this is one thing we know for sure 
that type of expression. Um, but instead, sex gets reduced to being a biological accident. And it gets to be made very impersonal, not just by pornography, but in school, sexual education. It's really like one of the most damaging things to sexuality. You know, I don't think most of us think of it as being significant, but imagine this is what, like one of the first, this is one of your first experiences with it. And it's made so sterile. You get a bunch of children together who don't have the hormones to understand it. You sit them down there in an environment that would never breed the atmosphere to learn about it, right? I'm talking about the atmosphere to think about sex. It's explorative in nature. It's It can't be prescribed. It can't be thrown onto you. It's It can't be force-fed to you in a classroom. It's something that you need to explore by yourself, not compelled, not pushed towards it, right? And this is our first experiences with it. Again, the institutions that are supposed to be in charge of, of, of teaching, of guiding, what do they know? How can they know what impact that has later on? So um, I'm almost at the end of this episode and the last post I'm going to read is a tough one as are the responses and it's just how I'm going to have to finish the show. Okay, This is two months ago. Someone said, I had a dream that my chest grew back and woke up in crisis. Then they have a little um, disclaimer, no politics, female advice only. So this is girls, right? Then in that post she writes, finally slept hard for the first time in months, enough to dream. Had a double mastectomy in 2022, I'm grieving. Response, first one. I had my double mastectomy back in 2021 and I denied regretting it for so long. When I finally let myself feel that regret, I would cry for hours. I still sometimes get nightmares about surgery or reverse dysphoria, but we can get better. Sending love with a heart emoji. I don't know if you guys are, um, I don't know if it's getting across, but to think about this like waking up from this nightmare or dream really the nightmare is reality a dream that this irreversible change that stole your identity that stole your future potential that you wake up and everything is okay and then you have to wake up to a reality then it isn't and it was removed so senselessly that's very difficult for me you know Second reply, we're all here for you with a heart emoji. I know I had several dreams about reverse dysphoria that I never had about my initial transition. I've dreamt about my body growing back a few times since my mastectomy at 19. It still eats me up inside, not so much that I don't have breasts, but that I didn't let myself grow into my natural body. I thought I had to fix myself, and now I dream about recovering it. You're not alone. And the last reply, I've had this so many times, still shakes me up and makes me feel depressed for the rest of the day. I'm sorry you're going through it too. So this is what we're allowing. And there is no body positivity in the world. Kids are coming up completely despising and hating their body, girls especially. Can you imagine like the most beautiful creatures in the world and, and because of these misunderstandings because of miscommunications because of these vain and, and, and shallow advertisements that we look up to and we never correct the, the the things that women think about themselves and and we never tell them the reasons we actually love them do we actually know do we encourage them enough right why don't we tell them that we value their thoughts or emotions more than their body that, that that that's part of who they are do we even know that because that's that's the real answer is that we don't know that men don't even know what they like so what are those values and, and why are those the values we don't tell them that and girls are coming up hating their body and they're removing their breasts it's insanity it, it is just like it's like the same thing out of all the things you would do to an infant that was just born, 
you would take a scalpel to the tip of their penis I, I this is insane the world I live in is insane and this is what happens it it's not gonna be undone unless we talk about this stuff and actually change it there's a genocide going on in the minds of our own children in the hearts of our own children and it's in our minds too because we were all wounded but survived right if we if we're we have a healthy sexuality we were wounded but we survived so a, as a survivor why are we not going back to save people from that trauma if we're not doing that what are we doing what's really important in life and whatever your personal answer because it is a personal question it's different for everybody whatever your personal answer is to that question it has to evolve involve it has to have consisting of it a long-term view to make it happen in the future whatever you think matters you need to have a long-term formula so that someone else can have it too so that your children can have it so that you can have it again in the future whether you're selfish or unselfish you need a long-term view to hold on to the things that you find valuable it's the most objective thing that that i can say it's that no one can argue against that whatever you think is the right thing you need to have a long-term plan to make sure that you can keep getting more of it and we can't do that with the most basic precious fundamental thing which is identity itself uh, which is unity and difference both of them right because we're all we all come from one thing right we're all the same really us men and women we're the same unit of love and life and and learning and experience but the the differences that make it so much more sweeter why can we not explain that to the kids why aren't we doing it thank you very much and i'll see you next week